Uh, my dad worked as a machinist for the Parrot, D.G. Parrot and Sons. I don't know if you remember them from Olympia. Uh, they were on, I think, 4th Avenue, uh, kind of diagonally across from where Bayview Thrift Boy is now, I think, if I remember right. I was pretty little. In fact, I wasn't even born when he worked there. <laughs> but uh, it used to be located there. But he was the one that got to see President Truman drive by in a convertible in Olympia. And so that was the only time he got to see a a real famous person live like that, like a president. So that was kind of neat to highlight for him and he talked about that quite often. So our topic is Harry Truman. Uh, Truman had a challenging duty uh, following the death of FDR who was very charismatic and everybody loved him, but he was more capable than many people believed. And uh, he, he had to meet with Stalin at Yalta. He had to make the tough decision about dropping the A-bomb on Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Had to confront General MacArthur, which wasn't an easy thing to do. I mean, Truman was a tough guy and I admire him a lot. So we're gonna hear some good stories about him. And uh, Steve Jones, who, who was just up here, but he, <laughs> He saw the crowd and ran away, so I guess I'm, no, 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 he's going to be here. He's a retired staff attorney for the Washington State Senate and uh, currently a tour guide of the state capitol. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about his presentation that he's given over the recent, well, past couple of years. And I, I'm really looking forward to this talk because I got a sneak peek at his PowerPoint pictures and they're good. You got a lot of Harry Truman photos here. So let's get to it and give a warm Schmidt House welcome to Steve Jones. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone. When Don told me that uh, we'd probably sell out today, I was more than a little skeptical, but I'm not skeptical any longer. <laughs> C can everyone hear? I've never been accused of having a soft voice. Everyone, okay. If not, just start waving. So, yeah. so I worked in the legislative building, our state capitol building, for 40 years on the staff of the state senate. And during that time, I had heard some stories from some folks I knew about Harry Truman's visit to our capital. And then three years ago, I retired and began my second career as a once a week tour guide, a volunteer in the Capitol building. And in the training for that position, they explained to me that the state reception room, that grand luxurious room with the Italian marble and the luxurious appointments, the most formal room in the building designed by the architects for uh, receptions and formal ceremonies that the last president of the United States to be received in the state reception room in our Capitol building was Harry Truman in June of 1945. And so I was curious as to why Harry was here, what he did while he was here, and curious about exploring some of the stories I had heard because I was a little skeptical as to whether they were true or apocryphal. So just for my own interest, I started poking around the State Library and the State Archives, and they referred me to the Truman Archives, and this story kind of fell in my lap. And uh, so I hope to share it with you. I think it's an educational, informative, but I also think it uh, has some uh, entertainment value to, as, to it as well. So this story is going to take some twists and, twists and turns. It's not going to follow a straight path. It's going to be a bumpy ride, so fasten your seat belts. <laughs> so we're going to start with President Harry Truman. And we're going to start on that fateful day, April 12, 1945. Harry Truman was vice president. He woke up in the morning. He had the same breakfast he had every single day, bourbon and bacon. <laughs> I don't make this up. He headed over to the Capitol where he spent the day presiding over the United States Senate, <clears throat> performing his constitutional duties as the presiding officer. And at the end of the day, he was where he could always be found at the end of each day during his tenure as vice president, having drinks in the office of Speaker Sam Rayburn. A phone call came in. Harry was wanted at the White House. 
His security man had gone home for the day, so the vice president drove himself over to the White House and was escorted into the private quarters where he was met by First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. She sat the vice president down and said, Harry, the president is dead. Harry had no idea. He was shocked. All he could do was stammer, oh my goodness, Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, wh what can I do for you? She goes, no, it's what I can do for you. You're the one in trouble now. <laughs> the, first, the first order of business was swearing in the new president. There was a small problem. They couldn't find a Bible. Harry wanted to use his grandfather's Bible, which was back in his office in the Capitol, at the, in, the, in the Senate, but there wasn't time to retrieve it. They scurried around, and finally the chief usher of the White House found an inexpensive Gideon Bible in the bottom drawer of one of the dressers, and Harry was sworn in on that Bible. As you can see from this picture, it was not a happy occasion. <laughs> Harry is here with his wife and his daughter, the president had just died. It was a very glum day. A few minutes after being sworn in, Secretary of War Henry Stimson swept into the room, took Harry aside into a private office, closed the door and said, Mr. President, I need to inform you that the United States has developed a terrible weapon. No one had ever informed the vice president of the atom bomb and the Manhattan Project. It was complete news to Truman. Very, very few officials knew. A well-kept secret. Secretary of War Stimson said, Mr. President, it will soon be your decision whether to use this weapon, where to use it, and when to use it. It was at that moment the full weight of the presidency fell onto the shoulders of Harry Truman. It was shortly after that that Harry decided he needed a vacation. <laughs> so a few weeks later, June of 1945, the scene changes to San Francisco and the great San Francisco Opera House where the World Peace Conference had been convened. Delegates of 60 nations were in San Francisco to draft the original charter for a new organization to be known as the United Nations. Harry Truman, President of the United States, was scheduled to give the closing address to that conference. So he was going to travel all the way across the country. So he said, if I'm going to go to San Francisco, I want to make a stop along the way. I want to stop in Olympia, Washington. <laughs> he knew the conference was in good hands because it was being chaired by a young assistant secretary of state, a, a surrogate of Harry Truman's, was handling the affairs in San Francisco, so Harry didn't need to worry about what was happening. The conference was in good hands. And we'll hear more about this gentleman, this young assistant secretary of state, in a few minutes. So why did Harry want to go to Olympia, Washington? And the reason is our governor, Monrad Walgren. Monrad Walgren had served as a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives and in the United States Senate before becoming governor. In fact, he still is the only governor the state of Washington has ever had that served in both houses of Congress in Washington, D.C. And they were fast friends, good buddies in Washington, D.C., particularly over the poker table. And Harry Truman <laughs> wanted to visit his old buddy, Monrad Walgren. Mon Walgren was a, uh, an optometrist by profession. His father was a jeweler, ran a jewelry store in downtown Everett. So when, when Monrad Walgren got his optometry license, he opened up his practice in his father's jewelry shop. So it was sort of one-stop shopping. It was before we had Fred Meyer. You could go in downtown Everett on Main Street, and you could go in and get a new diamond engagement ring and a new pair of glasses at the same time. <laughs> Monrad Walgren had three hobbies. The first was pool, and as a young man, he was national billiards champion. He was an expert at billiards. 
His second hobby was playing poker, and he spent many a night when he was in Congress serving with Harry Truman playing poker. And here you can see them. Uh, Monrad Walgren is on the far left, and standing over him is then Congressman Harry Truman, his favorite poker playing buddy. So in addition to pool and poker, Monrad Walgren's third favorite hobby was drinking. <laughs> And as soon as he was elected governor in 1944, defeating the Republican governor, uh, Arthur Langley, he had two bars installed in the governor's mansion on the Capitol campus. So Harry was looking very much forward to his trip across country to see Monrad Walgren in Olympia. And to get there, he took this airplane the sacred cow. This was long before Air Force One. This was the presidential aircraft that Harry inherited from Franklin Roosevelt. The press corps gave it its nickname, the sacred cow. The exact derivation of that name has been lost to history. I have not been able to find any book that told us what that meant, but this was the name the press corps gave to the uh, presidential aircraft. It was a unique airplane one of a kind. It was a Douglas, it was called the Douglas VC-54C. It was a purpose-built plane. Douglas took a smaller fuselage because the president did not travel with a large entourage back then, but he needed to go long distances at high speed, so they married the smaller fuselage to a larger pair of wings and engines. And so a unique aircraft. And this airplane is currently sitting in the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, and it has a very warm place in the hearts of Air Force veterans because later in his presidency, Harry Truman sat in this airplane when he signed into law the legislation that created the United States Air Force out of the old Army Air Force. Army Air Corps, Army Air Corps. thank you. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> This was an historic flight when Harry Truman took off from near Washington, D.C. on June 19, 1945. It was the first cross-country trip by any president. Now, Roosevelt had taken this plane to Europe for some of the uh, uh, conferences at the, towards the end of World War II, Potsdam, etc. But this was the first president to fly across country. Now this plane had some unusual features. It had a large picture window so that the president, whether Roosevelt or Truman, could sit at his desk and look out this picture window at the awaiting crowds on the tarmac. But most importantly, the public on the tarmac could look up and see the president sitting at his desk. This plane also had a very unusual feature. It had an elevator that could be lowered out of the belly of the plane underneath the wings down to the ground so that President Roosevelt could enter and leave the plane in his wheelchair without being seen. He did not want to be publicly seen in his wheelchair. Now this plane is also historic for another reason. Because on this flight on June 19, 1945, Harry Truman initiated a tradition that he carried out every single time he flew in this plane. Shortly after takeoff from Washington, D.C., he wandered to the rear of the aircraft and used the restroom. <laughs> then, a few hours later, after the crew notified him that the plane had entered the airspace over the state of Ohio, <laughs> the home state of his arch political rival, <laughs> Republican, wait for it, Republican Robert Taft, Harry wandered up to the cockpit and told the pilot, a Colonel Murphy, that it was time to evacuate the plane's holding tanks. <clears throat> I don't make this up. So they landed on the old McCord Field, now Joint Base Lewis-McCord, south of Tacoma, and the, the presidential motorcade came down the old Highway 99, long before Interstate 5, crossing the Nisqually River on the old Highway 99 bridge. We'll hear more about that bridge a little later. 
keep that in mind. And they arrived in Olympia and were greeted by Governor Walgren on the Capitol campus. Here you can uh, see them in this open car in front of our insurance building on the Capitol campus. Uh, Mon Walgren is uh, at the, behind the wheel of the car and some uh, military security folks are in the back seat. Here's another picture of the governor and the president standing in front of our insurance building. So, and here's a photograph of Harry and Mon Walgren coming down the steps of the legislative building, our Capitol building. Right behind them is, uh, in the double-breasted suit, seemed to be a lot of double-breasted suits back then, is a young congressman who had just been sworn into the United States Senate, Warren Magnuson, who went on for a long, long career in the United States Senate until 1980, I think it was, that he was defeated uh, by uh, Slade Gordon, I believe. So, Harry promptly settled in to the governor's office, took over the governor's desk, uh, made himself quite comfortable, did all of his work there. And to, uh, to the left side of the picture is Mon Walgren. To the right on the picture is Warren Magnuson again. Standing behind the governor's chair is Governor of Alaska, Ernest Gruning. And in case there was any doubt who they were gazing upon, Harry's portrait is on the wall. <laughs> Apparently the weather in June of 1945 was a little chilly in Olympia. Apparently Harry didn't bring enough warm clothes, so he quickly glommed on to the governor's sweater. This is a Cowichan sweater knitted by the native uh, uh, indigenous tribe on the southern end of Vancouver Island and the national press coverage showing the governor, and there were quite a few photographs, he wore this sweater throughout the trip. Uh, was a big economic boost for the Cowichan Indians and their, their cottage industry of knitting sweaters. Shortly after Harry, and this is a critical, critical juncture, shortly after Harry arrived in Olympia, he was told that the proceedings in San Francisco at the World Peace Conference were being delayed. They were bogged down. They weren't going as rapidly as expected, and that Harry needed to not spend two or three days in Olympia, he needed to stay there indefinitely. <laughs> he ended up spending six days in Olympia, waiting for the proceedings to wrap up in San Francisco. And the reason was they did not want the president to arrive at the San Francisco Opera House prematurely. It would be too much of a distraction to the delegates. They wanted him to sweep in on the last day when the deal was done and the charter was being signed and do the closing address. So he had to kill some time. Now, he, he told the press corps that the reason for the delay in San Francisco was because it was taking longer than expected to translate the charter documents into the languages of all 60 countries. Privately, he told a different story. He told his staff the proceedings in San Francisco were being delayed because of Russian meddling. <laughs> that sounds familiar, doesn't it? No. But again, President Truman was confident that everything was under control. He had his trusted surrogate, the Assistant Secretary of State, chairing the conference. He knew everything was going smoothly. He didn't have anything to worry about. He just had to figure out how to kill some time. So what did they do? Well, they had a medal ceremony on the steps of the Capitol building where Harry put a medal around the neck of a young soldier from, uh, I believe, the Bremerton area. Bainbridge Island. <laughs> Bainbridge Island. <laughs> Thank you. And Tell me the name of this young man, do you know? He, uh, he, apparently he, he lived a long life and someone told me he died about, about 2012. Oh, wow. Bud Hawk. Okay. There's a school in Bremerton and that comes from a reliable source, former Secretary of State Ralph Monroe, who I believe is probably somewhere in this picture. <laughs> So what else did they do? 
Oh, uh, they also had a concert on the steps of the Capitol from the Olympia High School marching band. At that time, some of you folks may remember, Olympia High School was right across the street. And I gave this talk a few months ago to a group of retired school teachers, and after my talk, a young woman of the sprightly age of the mid 80s came up and said, I was there, my brother was in, what? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, I, your brother was the drum master, and your name is Briggs? Lily Briggs and Lily went home and sent me a, a nice CD and some photographs of the band and uh, uh, performing on the steps of the Capitol. Photographs that I do not believe have been published anywhere since the annual yearbook of the Olympia High School. So uh, that's, and the, I, there are several other pictures. I haven't included them all for, for time purposes, but here's uh, Harry listening to the Olympia High School marching band. Uh, led by drum master, brother of Lily Briggs. Thank you very much. So what else did they do? Well, Harry wanted to go fishing, so they arranged a fishing trip off Anderson Island. And here is the president getting ready for the fishing trip, telling the press corps how big a fish he is going to catch. Probably not the last president to stretch the truth. I'm just guessing on that. So they headed off for the fishing trip, and once again, uh, Warren Magnuson made sure that he wedged his way in there between the, the governor and the president, and in the front seat is a uh, military security person with firm control on the Cowichan sweater. <laughs> Again, Warren Magnuson smoking the cigar, the president in the sweater. He was skunked. He didn't catch a single fish. They had to borrow a fish from a, uh, another boat in the area. And that got a lot of publicity. And uh, someone told me that the guy they borrowed the fish from got in trouble because he had told his boss he was sick that day. They took a motor trip up to Mount Rainier on another day to kill some time. Harry was thrilled because they let him drive the car. And that was a rare occasion for the president. He played the piano in the lobby of the uh, uh, Paradise Inn. That piano is still there. It survived the recent remodel. So they had fun up on uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, a photo of Mount Rainier and also the fishing trip. These last four photographs are from Life magazine. They had a two-page spread. It was a big deal for the governor to go on vacation during wartime. So it got a lot of national press. So one of the wonderful things I found in exploring this story were the Truman archives. And they have online Harry Truman's desk calendar showing what he did every minute of every day during his presidency. Who he met with, what meetings he went to, what ceremonies he participated in. Very thorough diary on the website of the Truman Library and Archives. But there are two days that are completely blank. Saturday and Sunday that he was in Olympia. June 23rd and 24. There is no historic record of where he was those two days. But we have a pretty good idea where he was because we have an eyewitness. And here's the background to that story. Monrad Walgren's sister had a summer cabin just five miles north or so of here, where we stand today, near Gull Harbor, Washington, out on the way up to Boston Harbor. She had a summer cabin. And there's some evidence that Harry went out and spent these two days in that cabin by himself no security detail, no one else, just Harry out there killing time. Now, th the, the history gets a little fuzzy here because Harry Truman, in addition to his trip in 1945, he also came through town in 1948 on a whistle stop campaign tour when he was running against uh, uh, Dewey for election to his first full term as president. And apparently he spent some time relaxing out at the Walgreens summer cabin on that trip as well. Next door, 
to the Walgren summer cabin was the property of the Cushman family. It is still the property of the Cushman family. Some of you may know the, the Cushmans. And uh, I heard the story from Mrs. Cushman's daughter. Mrs. Cushman was Julie Cushman. She was chair of the uh, English department at South Puget Sound. Her husband was uh, administrator in the Department of Transportation, I believe, and assistant director of highways. They owned the property next door. They still own it today. And Mrs. Cushman, before she passed away, used to tell a little story. And the details vary depending on which of the Truman children you ask, but the, the version that I like, <laughs> truth is not an obstacle, uh, <laughs> was that Mrs. Truman would, excuse me, not Mrs. Cushman told the story. She was a young lady in June of 1945. She came walking down Cushman Road. She goes, it was a Sunday morning and I was walking down the road to collect the family Sunday newspaper. And I came a around a bend in the road, and there, urinating in my cow pasture, <laughs> was the President of the United States. <laughs> and then the elderly, prim, and proper Mrs. Cushman would lean in close and look you in the eye and say, and Harry Truman was a man of great stature. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> so that concluded Harry's trip. The next morning, Monday morning, he went back up Highway 99 across the old 99 bridge on the Disqually back to McCord Field, got on the plane and flew to San Francisco. But this is where the story gets really interesting. Here's Harry sweeping onto the stage of the San Francisco Opera House to give the closing address to the World Peace Conference. And he's being greeted in this photograph by the young man, the young Assistant Secretary of State who was chairing the conference and in fact was elected the first acting Secretary General of the new organization, the United Nations. Oh, I haven't told you what this gentleman's name was. His name was Alger Hiss. Now, obviously some of you recognize that name, not all of you do. It was not a household name in 1945, but it became a much more prominent name three years later in 1948, when a disheveled Time Magazine editor named Whitaker Chambers testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee that in the 1930s, he, Whitaker Chambers, had been a courier for the Communist Party in Washington, D.C., and his job was to ferry documents between Alger Hiss and the Soviet Embassy. His allegation was that Alger Hiss would take documents out of the Department of State uh, cable room each night, take them home, where he would retype them long before Xerox machines, retype them on his now famous Woodstock typewriter bring them back in the morning and secret them back into the cable room, back into the diplomatic pouches before they were noticed that they were missing, and then turn the microfilm over to Whitaker Chambers to transmit to the secretary. Now here's a, a fairly well-known photograph, Harry Truman giving the closing address to the World Peace Conference creating the United Nations. Directly behind him, the white-haired gentleman is Secretary of State Edward Stett. Tinius, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, Statinius, and right next to him is the now infamous Alger Hiss. Now, the vast majority of the members of the House Un-American Activities Committee did not believe Whitaker Chambers' accusations. Alger Hiss had a long and illustrious career in the State Department. He came from a prominent Boston family, Harvard Law School. He clerked for the United States Supreme Court for legendary Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. He had impeachable credentials, a long career as Assistant Secretary of State. The members of the committee did not believe Whitaker Chambers, but one member was determined to run Alger Hiss to ground. That was a young, uh, fairly inexperienced congressman who was looking to make his name in Washington, D.C. Richard Nixon was determined to prove that Alger Hiss was a lifelong 
Soviet spy. He told Whitaker Chambers they needed hard evidence. They needed a smoking gun. They needed proof. So Whitaker Chambers told Nixon to come out to Westchester County, Maryland, and he brought with him his committee uh, investigator, Robert Stripling, seated here next to Nixon. It's the committee staff that always gets the goods. <laughs> and Whitaker Chambers took them out into his, his so a, he had a small farm, a hobby farm, took them out into his pumpkin patch, pulled the lid off a hollowed out pumpkin and retrieved 13 canisters of 35 millimeter microfilm of documents that on forensic examination proved to have been typed on Alger Hiss's Woodstock typewriter. And here is Stripling and, and Nixon examining what became very quickly known as the Pumpkin Papers. Alger Hiss was indicted for perjury for his testimony in front of the uh, House on American Activities Committee. It brought Nixon to national attention. And Dwight D. Eisenhower was running for president. He was being accused by the Democrats as being soft on communism. He was looking for a running mate that would bolster his reputation as a strong, ardent anti-communist. So he selected the young Richard Nixon as his running mate. And as they say, the rest is history. So that concludes our story of Harry's historic holiday in Olympia and the unusual historical threads that run through that visit. But I'd like to end with one small epilogue. Whatever happened to Monrad Walgren? <laughs> well, I told you he was elected in 1944 by defeating Republican Arthur Langley. Langley came back in 48 and returned the favor by defeating Monrad Walgren became governor again, our only governor to serve two non-consecutive terms. So suddenly in 1948, Monrad Walgren was unemployed. He needed a job. Who did he turn to? Of course, Harry Truman. Harry appointed Monrad to the National Security Resources Board which was a big deal back then. This was a board charged with allocating the, score, the scarce resources coming out of World War II. You know, there was a lot of rationing in the war. And it was a very important board. The United States Senate declined to confirm Monrad Walgren, despite the fact that he was a former senator. They didn't think he had any qualifications to serve on this important board. He had no experience, no professional uh, uh, background in this area. They did not confirm him. Truman had to withdraw the nomination. After an appropriate period of time, Truman then appointed Walgren to the Federal Power Commission. He was promptly confirmed because of his background as governor of Washington and Washington's role in the Great Pacific Northwest hydroelectric grid. He was confirmed to that position. He served several terms. He became the chair of the commission and he retired from the Federal Power Commission in 1951 and retired back to Washington where he maintained a home both in Olympia and in his hometown in Everett. And it was on July 8th, 1961, while traveling between his two homes from Olympia going north up to Everett, he was driving across the old Highway 99 Nisqually Bridge, the same bridge that brought Harry Truman to Olympia on that June 19, 1945. Monrad Walgren came across a young nurse in a disabled vehicle. He got out of his car and was directing traffic around the nurse's car when he was struck by a drunk driver. He lingered for 13 weeks and died on September 18th, 1961, and he is buried in the Everett Cemetery. So on that sad note, I will conclude my remarks. I hope I provided some education as well as some entertainment. And I, the theme of this is that when you start pulling on our local historical threads, as you all know who've attended these lectures in the past, it's amazing what things are connected to it and the colorful history we have here in Olympia and Tumwater. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for coming out today.
15 minutes if you'd like to ask some questions or comments. Yes, sir. You mentioned the um, the cabin out Cushman Road. Yeah. When I first moved here, there was a whole bunch of big boats sitting out there. Do you think that the location of the mothball? Do you remember, you remember what I'm talking about? I, I I know a little bit about the mothball. Is fleet. there a connection? I, I, Why was that place chosen? Did it have anything to do with the fact that Harry was there on that beach prior? Uh, I, I I I do not know. Okay. I can make something up if you'd like. Please do. <laughs> uh, uh, I I. I think it may just be a coincidence that Walgren's sister had a cabin there, because obviously he was there because of the connection to Walgren. But I, I, I do remember, I've seen a lot of pictures of the old mothball fleet, yes. That's another lecture. Yes? <laughs> Did Truman ever visit the Hanford site? Someone asked me that just the other day uh, and, and said, uh, I've, I, uh, the question was, was Truman ever visit the Hanford site, which was part of the Manhattan Project? And uh, I mentioned just a few days ago to a friend that I was giving this lecture about this 1945 trip, and they said, is that the time he visited Hanford? So I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I, I've heard something to the effect that he did at some point during his presidency. What, what, when was the bomb dropped? Was that before this trip or after? It was after this trip. I believe it was in September. Uh, just a few months later. August, August. I think the first was in August and the second was in September, I believe. Okay, both. Sixth and ninth, okay, okay. We have some eyewitnesses. <laughs> yes. Yes. Go, go ahead. Any, any chance that that cabin fishing thing with the president all by himself was fabricated so in fact he did travel? Over there. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose it's possible. I suppose it's possible. The cabin is still there, and in fact, the uh, the the cabin is now owned by one of the Cushman sons. And I just it's still there. That, that Cushman one was fabricating other parts of the story that she told as well. I don't know. Could be. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> so, yes, Tony. Any any poker playing uh, stories while he was here? Since that was a big. Uh, a part of his entertainment and, and his link to the governor? Uh, we know he played poker with the governor while he was here several times. Uh, we're, I, I'm not aware of any particular stories that came out of those poker games. So if there's nothing else, thank you all once again for coming.